Welcome to this edition of Engineering Track. We will today bring you students of University of Lagos who constructed an electric car. Nigeria is going somewhere. We also showcase an indigenous aluminum roving sheet company who has made a landmark in the roving sheet manufacturing. Watch out for this and more on the show today. But first, Engineering News. This is Engineering Track and I am Tintayo Fagboro. Aluminium, which emanates from the Latin word alumin, was first employed by Pliny, but was not until 1722. Friedrich Hoffmann concluded from experiments that the base of alum was through and distinct S. Before the end of century, the name of the material was anglicized to alumina. In 1807, British scientist Sir Humphrey Davy was convinced that alumina had metallic base and attempted to reduce it by eating it with potash and electrolyzing mixture. His efforts were unsuccessful but later pushed the research efforts to the next busy brain scope by H.C. Ørsted, a Danish scientist. In 1825, by eating potassium amalgam, and distilling the mercury from the resultant aluminium amalgam. By 1845, Wuer succeeded in producing aluminium in pieces of the pin X. Wuer then measured the specific graffiti, air stability, and ductility of the melter he had obtained. The significance of these experiments was that the light weight of aluminium translated from unknown quantity into broad limelight in the building project in Nigeria today. In this same spirit, aluminium roofing sheets are discovered as an alternative to iron roofing sheets. Aluminium roofing sheets are widely used in residential buildings, industrial, civil buildings and warehouses. The biggest benefit is that this lasts for as long as 100 years, as this do not rust and is one of the most durable options you have. These roofing sheets also do not rot and you do not have to worry about insect attacks like termites and the likes. Also resistant to fire, another benefit that might save lives during accidents. Aluminum by its, by its nature, by its chemical composition, it's not something that can uh, get destroyed due to vagaries of weather. Crown King Aluminium, which is located along Ikirun Road, Oshibu, is an indigenous producer and installer of highly durable long span aluminium roofing sheets. Crown King Metal and Aluminium Investment Limited. In our company, we produce long span aluminium roofing sheets. The aluminium roofing sheet is usually cut, drilled, embellished with the general machine, and the aluminium roofing sheet has a good process performance, which can be directly bent by the pressure tension, and it is widely used in the industry for construction. To make these aluminium roofing sheets, the reel of oven-baked colored aluminium coils are loaded onto the corrugating machine. The machine produces different design of aluminium roofing sheets. The operator controls the movement of the aluminium along the machine. Music 
as it passes through the machine rollers, the shape are formed. When the required length is reached, the machine cuts the sheets and the process continues. This is the aluminum before and after corrugation. There are different machines for different designs of corrugated aluminum roofing sheets. This is a step tiles type. Crown King Aluminium is owned by a financial expert who is not an engineer but has passion for manufacturing and see need for such company here in Oshun. As an economist, I know the future of our country is manufacturing. Any country that doesn't have a manufacturing base is living on borrowed ropes. The, the economy of that country will collapse one day. And having that knowledge, that will work for me to go into manufacturing, otherwise I would have invested in other areas where I would just be doing buy and selling. I also realized that uh, there is a huge gap, there is a deficit in the uh, housing need of their people. As at the last count, statistics given by the Federal Office of Statistics said Nigeria is short of 20 million houses. Crown King Aluminium also said and installed stone-coated alu-zinc roof tiles aluminum windows and doors, cutting wall and alubond cladding. One thing that distinguishes us from the rest is the quality of our product and the quality of our service too. Uh, apart from having very good quality aluminum roofing sheet materials, we have very qualified technicians and engineers who know so much about roofing uh, technology. So after the product are purchased, they install it and it's always uh, a very good thing. So we encourage our customers to give us patronage and encourage us to do more. We don't want to have the, the factory in Oshubo alone. We want to go to other locations in, in the state. For your house roofing, be it residential, office or factory, visit Crown King Aluminium today. Truth is, when I decided it was going to be zero emissions, I was actually 21. So, the reason being, well, it was obvious. Cars are going electric. Analysts say that in the next 15 years, more than half of all cars sold around the world will be either partially electric or fully electric. So I felt if I was going to do anything, car, it has to be an electric car. That was just it. I have to follow the paradigm shift. One day, cars will be made in Nigeria. Here in an engineering laboratory in the University of Lagos, this group of undergraduate students see the possibility of a made in Nigeria car. Olukoya, a student of mechanical engineering, has shared with his friends the dream of building an electric car. Everything used here is sourced locally, and yes, all hands are on deck. It's been a very tough journey. And uh, it's been a little, very, very difficult, but we thank God that we were able to get here. This car is designed for zero vehicle emission. Olukoya knows that climate change is poised to disrupt the global economy, and low-income countries stand to lose the most. Now he has come up with a futuristic plan. You know, the truth is that we realized that the trend automobiles the world trend for automobiles right now is towards hybrids and electrics you know analysts say that in the next 15 years more than half of all the cars sold will be electric and we feel you know this being nigeria and we being you know full of geniuses right here that we should on our own try and come up with something especially in school because we all most of us here are all undergraduates and we felt you know that we just had to try our hands on something just be a little bit practical you know, and use that to solve a problem. So the problem here was lack of fuel and um, pollution of the environment. So we decided, okay, Dove, electric, zero emissions, that's what we should do. Test driving. This car brings hope that one day, cars designed by these geniuses will also drive on the highways in Nigeria. Ah. We just came up with this initiative to challenge ourselves because there are so many youths out there that belittle themselves and which is not supposed to be. We believe the Dove platform is supposed to inspire the youth to do more than what they are doing now. Oh, in the next 10 years, Nigeria will be driving electric cars. 
Yes, by let, me, let me put it that way. Nigeria will be driving electric cars made by Dove. There are plans to improve on this model and build a conventional car. They hope that holding an exhibition like this one will help them raise funds to fulfill their dreams. It's the future of vehicles in general, not just Nigeria, but all over the world. And I believe that with time, as technology comes, expand, technology of electric cars, of course, it's still a developing field and some things are still being put in place, especially with battery technology and um, increasing the range of electric vehicles. But I believe that with time, it's going to expand to Nigeria and um, acceptance and coverage will be increased in Nigeria in the near future. Using electric car, you need power. And that's one of the things this association in this country is trying to solve. And part of the things I've learned in class is there's a game changer coming to this country, which is battery able to store power for a longer time. So having this in our country, and this battery can be used for big things too, like your factories and so So having this in Nigeria, this will give us enablement to charge because that's the main issue, that's the main problem of an electric car. And solving the power issues of this country, which I believe is going to be done soon, electric cars will be highly welcomed. Learned a lot about innovation, which I would like to pass on to you now so that you may go and change the world. Okay? This is my top 10 of the art of innovation. It starts with the desire to make meaning as opposed to make money. Making meaning means that you change the world. So my first thought for you is determine how you can make meaning. How can you change the world? Here are some examples. With Apple, Apple wanted to democratize computers. They wanted to bring computing power to everyone. That's the meaning they made. With Google, they wanted to democratize information, making information available to everyone. With eBay, they wanted to democratize commerce so that anyone with a website could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with any other large retailer. Examples of companies making meaning, and YouTube finally wanted to enable people to create video, to upload video, to share video. So these are, this is an example of the company and the kind of meaning they made. And as you know, they all made this kind of meaning and they've been highly, highly successful. So what I noticed in my career is that if you truly want to make meaning, it's the first step towards innovation. The second step is to make a mantra, a two or three, maybe four word explanation of why your meaning should exist. Don't make a mission statement, make a mantra. Wendy's mantra should be healthy, fast food. Three words that determine what Wendy's is trying to do. Somewhat oxymoronic, but healthy, fast food. Nike. Nike has a great slogan, just do it. That's a slogan. A mantra explains why you should exist. And the Nike mantra is authentic athletic performance. And finally, there's FedEx. When you absolutely, positively want something somewhere, what does FedEx stand for? It stands for peace of mind. So my second recommendation to you is that when you decide on the kind of meaning you make, try to find two or three words that describe why that meaning should exist. Not a 50-word mission statement, two or three-word mantra. The third thing is a matter of perspective. The perspective is to jump curves. The greatest example of this occurs in the ice business. Ice 1.0, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, there was an ice harvesting business in the United States. This meant that Bubba and Junior, during winter, would go to a frozen lake or a pond, cut blocks of ice. Nine million pounds of ice was harvested in 1900. Their idea of innovation was bigger horse, more horses, bigger sleigh, sharper saw. But it was fundamentally, wait for winter, live in a cold city, cut blocks of ice. 30 years later, we have ICE 2.0. Now we have the ICE factory. Major technological breakthrough. It did not have to be winter. It did not have to be a cold city. You froze water centrally and delivered it via the ICE man in the ICE truck. Imagine the breakthrough this was. No more limitations by climate. No more limitations by season. You could have an ICE factory. 30 years go by, we have ICE 3.0, refrigerator curve. Now, 
Now, it's not a matter of can you freeze water centrally? Can you put it in a truck? Can you deliver the ice to people? Now, everybody could have their own personal ice factory, a PC, if you will, a personal chiller. <laughs> the very interesting story about all of these curves is that none of the organizations that were ice harvesters became ice factories, and ice factories did not become refrigerator companies because most companies define themselves in terms of what they do not the benefits they provide. If you define yourself as we cut blocks of ice out of lakes, you remain an ice harvester. If you define yourself as we freeze water centrally, you remain an ice factory. If you define yourself as we make a mechanical gadget called a refrigerator, then you stay on the refrigerator curve. Great innovation occurs when you get to the next curve, when you go from telephone to internet, when you go from daisy wheel printer to a laser printer, to 3D printing. Great innovation occurs on the next curve. The fourth thing is to roll the dicey. These are the five qualities of great innovation. Great innovation is deep, lots of features, lots of functionality. This is a picture of a fanning sandal made by Reef, arguably the deepest sandal ever made. Every sandal has one primary purpose, to protect your feet. If you look at that circled area, that's a metal clip. That metal clip is for the sandal to open beer bottles. This sandal has twice the functionality, twice the depth of any other sandal in the world. Great products are also complete. It's the totality of the product. If the software business, it's not just the software. It's not just the DVD. It's the webinars. It's the documentation. It's the Android developers. If you have an I, excuse me, if you have an Android phone, it's the iOS developers. If you have an iOS phone, it's the totality. Great products are also empowering. They make you more creative, more productive. They enhance you. They change the meaning of your life. <laughs> and finally, great products are elegant. Somebody cared about the user interface. So as you go through life and you're trying to jump curves, ask yourself, am I creating something that's deep and intelligent and complete and empowering and elegant? Am I rolling the dicey? The fifth thing is I stole from something, I stole something from Bobby McFerrin. He had a great song, Don't Worry, Be Happy. But what innovators do is Don't Worry, Be Crappy, which is to say, when you have the first refrigerator, there may be elements of crappiness to it. When you have the first laser printer, there may be elements of crappiness to it. When you had the first Macintosh, thanks to my efforts, there was no software, there was no hard disk, not enough RAM, too slow a chip, lots of elements of crappiness to it. But if you waited for the perfect world and you waited till the chips were cheap enough and fast enough and everything was in place, you would never ship. And I learned a very valuable lesson. Don't worry, be crappy. When you have jumped to the next curve, it's okay to have elements of crappiness to your revolution. I am not saying you should ship crap. I am saying that you should ship things that are revolutionary innovative, on the next curve, that have elements of crappiness to it. Biotech people, ignore this slide. <laughs> number six. Number six is to let a hundred flowers blossom. I stole this from Chairman Mao, although it's not clear to me he ever implemented this. Letting a hundred flowers blossom means that at the start of great innovation, you may think you have in mind exactly who your user is, exactly who your customer is, what they should do with your product. And you may be surprised the people are going to use your product in ways you did not anticipate. And it's going to be people who you did not anticipate would be using it at all. And when this occurs, hallelujah, thank God that it's occurring. Positioning and branding ultimately comes down to what the consumer decides, not to what you decide. So with Macintosh, we thought we had a spreadsheet database and word processing machine. We were zero for three there. What made Macintosh successful was Aldous PageMaker. PageMaker created a field of flowers called desktop publishing. Desktop publishing was what saved Macintosh, not spreadsheet database or word processor. If we focused on spreadsheet database and word processor and ignored desktop publishing, Apple would be dead today. If Apple were dead today, it would be a different world. We'd all have phones with real keypads. We'd have phones where the battery lasted for more than a day. We'd have phones where the GPS actually worked. It would be a different world, <laughs> right? All this page maker was a gift from God to Apple because it saved Apple. I believe in God, and one of the reasons why I believe in God is there is no other explanation for Apple's continued survival than the existence of God. <laughs> Let a hundred flowers blossom. Don't be proud. 
Take your best shot with positioning and branding. But then when customers use your product, if they say it's a desktop publishing machine, hallelujah, declare victory. It is now a desktop publishing machine. Number seven, polarize people. Great products, great services, great innovation polarizes people. This is a TiVo. People like me who travel a lot, I love TiVo. We have four TiVos in our house. I need to time shift a lot of TV. I love to watch TV. Now, there are people who also hate TiVo. People who hate TiVo usually work for large brands and advertising agencies because people like me, we watch advertising one day a year, about a week ago, right? We watch <laughs> Super Bowl ads. The rest of the year, we're fast forwarding through TiVo, with TiVo through ads. Great products polarize people. If you're an agency, you hate TiVo. I'm not saying that you should intentionally piss people off, but I'm telling you that great products polarize people. Don't be afraid of polarizing people. Number eight is churn, baby, churn. This is stolen from the Black Panthers who said burn, baby, burn. But what innovators in business do is they churn, baby, churn. They take version one and they make it one, 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 two, one, three, one, four, one, five, two point oh. The hardest thing in the world because to be an innovator, you need to be in denial. You need to be in denial because the naysayers are going to tell you, it can't be done, it shouldn't be done, and it isn't necessary. You need to ignore those people. But as soon as you ship, you need to flip that bit and start listening to people and churn your product. Change it, change it, and change it, and keep evolving it. <laughs> if you're an engineer, you make a product that's unique and valuable. If you're a marketing person, you communicate to the world that your product is unique and valuable. Number 10, perfect your pitch. If you're an innovator, you have to learn to pitch. 11, as a bonus to my friends here at Cal, don't let the bozos grind you down. The bozos are going to try to grind you down. And the more innovative you are, the more they'll try to grind you down. There are two kinds of bozos in the world. I'm an expert in bozos, OK? Two kinds of bozos, slovingly disgusting, pocket protector, body odor, just a loser of a person. Rusty car, Japanese watch, you look at that person, you say, wow, what a loser. That person is not dangerous because that person is so obviously a loser. Only a loser would listen to that loser. And because you're not losers, you won't listen to that person. Hence, that person is not dangerous. The dangerous bozo dresses in all black. The dangerous bozo ends a lot, owns a lot of stuff that ends in I, like Armani, Maserati, Lamborghini, Ferrari, okay? <laughs> Audi is okay, rare exception. <laughs> That's the dangerous bozo because you think rich and famous parses too smart, but rich and famous parses too lucky, not smart, at least half the time. So I believe that bozosity is like the flu. You need to be exposed to bozosity so that when you encounter big bozosity, you have already built up the antigens. I'm going to expose you to some bozosity. I think there's a world market for maybe five computers. Ch Thomas Watson of IBM. Five computers. I have five Macintoshes in my house. In other words, I have all the computers he anticipated in the world in my house today. <laughs> this telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is inherently of no value to us. Western Union, internal memo, 1876. Western Union wrote off telephony in 1876. Western, Western Union should be PayPal today. Oops. <laughs> There's no reason why anyone would want a computer in their home. Ken Olson, great innovator, great entrepreneur, said this about computers. There's no reason to have a computer in your home. How many have a computer in your home today? Because according to Ken Olson, there's no reason. He was a great innovator, extremely good entrepreneur, but he was so successful on, let us say, the ice factory curve, he could not appreciate the next curve, the refrigerator curve. And that is the art of innovation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed the program. For inquiries on sponsorship, call any of this number. Join us for another interesting edition next time. Bye-bye.